promoter called PR 2.1, which was actually initially designed by Jeremy Nathans. Uh, he, he proved that this PR 2.1 promoter, which is a pr the red cone opsin promoter, human red cone opsin promoter, will in <coughs> fact drive cone specific expression in a transgenic animal. So we're using his promoter for many years now. 2.1 is means the size, the length is 2.1 kilobases in length. Okay, first first model uh, that we that we studied was this GNAT2 model, a re relatively rare form of achromatopsia, uh, and the vector is the serotype 5 PR2.1 using the mouse GNAT2 cDNA, and that was published in 2007. So what I'm going to do is give you only the, a behavioral outcome for each of these animal models, not the ERGs, not the structure. You just have to assume it's there, or the, or the referees wouldn't have accepted our publications. But the the uh, behavioral uh, model for the mice, anyway, is is this, uh, as you know, this virtual rotating drum that has stripes that can rotate, and if they rotate to the right, the animal uh, will move his head to the right if he can see the stripes, and and he'll use only his left eye to do that. And uh, you can then change the uh, parameters of the stripes so you can measure visual acuity by how wide the black and white stripes are. There'll be a point at which he can't see the stripes anymore. That's his threshold visual acuity. And of course, conversely, stripes go to the right, his head moves to the right, and he's using his right eye. I may have said right and left wrong before, but you can see what I was saying. Okay. So for GNAT2, I'm only going to show the one outcome here, visual acuity, untreated eyes, Wild type eyes in red and the treated eye in blue, and you can see there's been an improvement to essentially wild type uh, visual acuity, mouse visual acuity anyway, with a very good uh, p value. Second model was for the A3 form of achromatopsia, one of the subunits of the, of the cation channel. Uh, again, serotype 5. We used a CBA, uh, a, a general promoter here. Uh, uh, we have subsequent to this paper, we have used the the PR 2.1 as well, it works just fine. And it's using with the mouse CNGA3 uh, cDNA. Again, the, op the optokinetic uh, apparatus, visual acuity, uh, again, a little bit different order here, but uh, untreated eye, treated eye, then re regains visual acuity back to basically wild type with a p value of 0.05. Okay, uh, we have another animal model for A3 achromatopsia. This is a recent one that's not published. Uh, it's really run through A. Albanine in Israel at uh, Hadassah University in Jerusalem. Uh, we've made the vector for this, for this model. The vector is, again, AV5, PR2.1, in this case, human CNGA3. Not sheep, not mouse, but human. And in this case, it's a, it's a, it's a behavioral uh, test where the sheep, sheep has to navigate through this not so complicated maze, but they sheep like other sheep. And so if you put the animal, the test animal over there, they like to go to their, their friends over here, if they can see it. Uh, and we'll see an, un, an untreated animal actually can't find his way through the maze, but a treated animal can. And here's, here's the results. The untreated animal basically can't get through the maze, so there's really no, this is the amount of time it takes to get through the maze. Uh, but treatment, the treatment effect brings it right down to almost uh, wild type normal level behavior. So he, he can find his friends with, with one eye treated. Okay, the fourth model is a B3 achromatopsia model in dogs. There's also a mouse model, but I'm just showing you uh, some of the results here. Again, stereotype 5, PR 2.1, and again, human CNAG B3, not, not, not A3. That was published uh, a couple years ago, three years ago. Uh, again, this is, uh, John gave, me a, gave a nice introduction to this. This is the this is the earlier maze that the Gus Aguri and William Beltran uh, constructed. I guess it was, it was not William at that time. It was Andres Kamarami and Gus Aguri. But the dog has, uh, has to find his way through this maze, and sort of that's what he's going to do if he can see his way uh, with any efficiency at all. And the behavior uh, is shown here. Uh, untreated eyes, treated eyes, wild type. So you can see that the treatment effect is really very profound, nearly again back to wild type uh, behavior through this maze with a good p-value. Um, let's look now at a, a primate form of, of, of foveal deficiency, excellent color blindness. In this case, it's red color blindness, so it's protonopia, not a, not a, disease, not a blinding disease, a condition, but it, it mimics, it allows us to test the idea that we can deliver a cone gene to a primate fovea. Again, AAV5, PR2.1, in this, in this case, the human red opsin promoter cDNA is 
what we're going to deliver. This is in collaboration uh, with the Knights, uh, formerly at uh, uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, now at University of Washington. And I can't go into a lot of detail on this, but the testing apparatus, uh, they've actually, the Knights has trained the, trained the monkeys, uh, the, the red color blind monkeys, to select between three panels here. One of them has the test color, the others have some other color or a neutral color, and the idea is they've trained them to choose the one panel that looks different from the other two. So this, this, this is a treated animal. He's just touched with his nose uh, the, the correct panel, so he gets a little reward. He's drinking a little grape juice. Uh, so the results uh, are shown. This is uh, the, the scales are, are complicated. I, I don't want need to go into it, but I just want to show you that that a red colorblind monkey has a has basically cannot see this wavelength or this wavelength of light. It's mixed with other wavelengths. It's really on a color uh, spectrum. Uh, and this is squirrel monkey one, squirrel monkey two. They both demonstrate that their protonopes they, they they don't see red well. They don't distinguish red from other colors. Basically, this is pretreatment in both of these animals with that vector, and this is post-treatment. Not quite back to baseline, which would be down about here, but you can see a, a big improvement in their behavioral ability to see red. They're now being able to pick out red at a much lower luminance than they were before. Okay, so actually in summary, um, I've shown you the four species in four, and four genetic forms of foveal cone disease. Cones can be targeted by the right uh, combination of AAV serotype and promoter and can lead to behaviorally confirmed improvement in cone-mediated vision. Well, I had mentioned one other disease, blue cone monochromacy, and I haven't talked about it yet. Well, we don't, we're in the early, fairly early phases of it. We don't have behavioral studies. This, uh, this is based on a, a rat BCM model that was discovered in China a few years ago. We're collaborating with them, and we have sent Vector over there, and I've sent a surgeon as well uh, to, to China to do these experiments, and they have su subsequently done uh, cone-mediated ERG analysis on these I hope you can see this. This is a photopic flicker. Uh, here is an example of a treated eye, nice flicker response, about 10 microvolts. And here is the untreated eye in the same animal, basically no response. Uh, the p-value is 008 uh, over, uh, over six uh, treated eyes in six different animals. So we think that, uh, that, the, that there is going to, going to be a behavioral improvement when we can get around to doing that. It's difficult from six, 7,000 miles away, but uh, we're getting there. So basically what I, I mean, we can maybe change the four species in four genetic forms to five species in five genetic forms, if you will. So basically, what's next? What are we going to do with this kind of uh, information? Well, three things. Uh, uh, good news is that I, it looks like, according to NIH, and this is sequester proof, I'm told, that we will get this uh, a, a gene therapy clinical trial initiated, uh, the process for initiating a clean gene therapy clinical trial for B3A chromatopsia in April. So we'll see if that notice of award actually gets here. Uh, uh, secondly, since B3 and A3A chromatopsia patients have essentially identical clinical uh, 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 presentations, A3 patients will be discovered and, uh, and characterized during the B3 natural history uh, study. So A3 uh, clinical trial will actually proceed in parallel with B3, and that will be separately funded through corporate support. So A3 and B3 chromatopsy are, are, on, are on track. And the, the BCM and G, uh, gene therapy clinical trial is under development, and that's funded with private support. So three, at least three of the major uh, cone-specific foveal uh, diseases, uh, I think, have a future in, in the clinic, at least uh, testing in the clinic. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to come here and talk to you about our work today. So um, I, this is in the section called gene therapy via viral vectors, but we're not doing gene therapy and we're not using viral vectors, and in fact, this isn't optogenetics either. This is an alternative approach to restoring uh, light sensitivity to blind retinas using uh, chemistry, really, um, a group of molecules that we call uh, photoswitch molecules. And, um, and so uh, John already introduced, John Flannery already introduced you to this in uh, retinitis pigmentosa and uh, other neurodegenerative diseases of the retina, the photoreceptor layer uh, gradually dies off, leaving the rest of the retina there, but uh, sort of all dressed up with nowhere to go, not, not getting any uh, light-dependent signaling anymore, and only 
over, uh, over a long time? Are there changes to the inner retina? So the idea is that if you could somehow install artificially light sensitivity into these surviving neurons, you might be able to restore the perception of visual images uh, by individuals uh, suffering from these kind of, of disorders. So one way to do this is genetically by putting optogenetic tools into, into uh, these surviving neurons. But we've been using an alternative approach, which is uh, developing small molecule photo switches that can confer light sensitivity without gene therapy uh, and therefore uh, can sort of serve, uh, or could serve as, as sort of simple drugs for, for treating RP. So um, here's an example of the kind of molecule that I'm talking about. And these molecules have, have three parts. The central part is called azobenzene, which is photoisomerizable. So it changes shape with different wavelengths of light. On the one end of the other one end of this azobenzene is a ligand that somehow interacts with uh, voltage-gated channels and, and uh, acts as a blocker in those channels. Uh, and then the other end of the molecule is a chemical group that either attaches these molecules covalently or just lets them linger around on the inside of ion channels. And so here's an example of these molecule of one of these molecules at work. Uh, in this case, the blocker is tetraethyl ammonium, a classic blocker of potassium channels. And the other end of the molecule is sort of a, a greasy hydrophobic group. And so this molecule is membrane permeant. It, it accumulates in a cell. It integrates itself in the lumen of an ion channel. It blocks in one configuration, but when you photoisomerize it, it no longer blocks in the other configuration. And you can go back and forth between these cis and trans configuration between different wavelengths of light. So uh, we've already published on the use of, of molecules like this for restoring light sensitivity to blind mice, in particular, uh, this RD1 strain of mice that essentially has retinitis pigmentosa. And so we use these mice uh, months after birth when the photoreceptors are already gone. I'm sorry, one more thing about these molecules. Um, this just shows the activity of one of these photoswitch molecules on a generic neuron growing in cell culture. And you can see when you put the molecule on, on these cells, as you block or unblock the certain subtypes of potassium channels in these neurons, you can induce action potential firing or uh, cause that effect to, to, to disappear as you go back and forth between different wavelengths of light. And the, the photo effect happens quickly, reliably over many trials. There's no photo bleaching or anything like that of, of this molecule. And you can see the onset of the response is, is very, very fast. And you can uh, you know, do this in a more refined way you, by changing the equilibrium between the cis and the, and the trans state. You can dial in how much excitability you want to have in a particular neuron. So, um, so of course, this then becomes a, an approach to restoring light sensitivity to the retina. So as I said, we use retina from blind RD1 mice where the photoreceptors are, are completely gone. We do recordings from using a multi-electrode array uh, with the ganglion cell side facing the electrodes in the array. And um, before adding our molecule, the retina is blind. And so you can see all these units, all these individual neurons, their activities are unaffected by change, changing the wavelength of light. Um, and the average activity is flat as you go back and forth between different illumination conditions. But if you apply this AQ compound for just 15 minutes, and then wash it away, the effect persists, now you get all the ganglion cells responding robustly to light. Uh, light onset uh, causes a burst of firing of action potentials. This subsides a bit over time. Another wavelength of light returns the activity to where it started. So, so we have uh, uh, electrophysiological evidence, I'm not going to go through all the detail, that this molecule is working on many of the neurons that are surviving in the retina. And in addition, uh, we have behavioral experiments showing that we can restore light-sensitive behavior. And for some reason, this didn't download perfectly well. So we're just going to do it the old-fashioned way. Here is a movie. Uh, can we start from the beginning again? This is a mouse with no rods, no cones, and no melanopsin. If you just look at this eye, 
you will see that the flash of light after AQ has been injected causes pupillary constriction. This is the same eye before, before, uh, a, before injection of this photo switch, and basically the pupils are fixed and dilated, just the way they say on all the ER shows when a patient can't respond to light. So, so, uh, so we're able to, there's many other behaviors that we've also been looking at, including light avoidance behaviors. Most recently, we have a fear conditioning assay, and we can show that mice can actually remember uh, the um, pairing of, uh, you know, the, the association between light and an aversive stimulus and respond accordingly over a long time after, after the photo switch injection. So, so this AQ molecule that we've already published about um, has some problems. And uh, the, the main problems are that it, requir it requires uh, UV light, which is, of course, not going to be very uh, useful in, in humans, partly because the lens and the cornea are just going to filter it out and it's never going to make it to the retina. It also requires really bright light, like standing on top of a mountain looking down in the snow at noon without your ski goggles on. And, and finally, this molecule dissipates rather quickly from the eye, requiring you know, frequent resupply. So we've been in search of derivatives of AQ that are more useful. And we now have a whole series of red shifted molecules shifted by at least 100 nanometer in their absorbance spectra. Um, and the one that's the best is called DNAC. Uh, and it responds perfectly well to gr light in sort of the green part of the spectrum. In fact, you can use white light as well. And um, here is a recording, again, a multi electrode array recording of a retina uh, before DNAC application. This is in response to just flashing white versus black light. And here's the response after DNAC injection. So there's this really dramatic photosensitization of retinal ganglion cells. They're all responding with the same polarity. There's no on and off cells anymore. But they're responding nonetheless, and they're doing so uh, to white light and even to green light and longer wavelength light. And if we look carefully at the t intensity requirements for getting this response to occur, uh, it turns out that um, it's actually quite good. I mean, it's quite reasonable levels of light. So the black uh, graph here shows the intensity response relationship for AAQ, our original photo switch. Um, and here is sort of the threshold light intensity that you need for getting a response. That, like I said, is very bright photopic conditions. Um, and here is DNAC and a related compound called BNAC. Uh, they respond uh, to about a hundredfold dimmer intensity of light. And just for your reference, this is the response threshold of, of channel rhodopsin expressed in retinal ganglion cells or halorhodopsin expressed in remnant cones. This comes from data from uh, Botan Roska's lab. And you can see that the threshold for getting DNAC to respond, DNAC treated retinas to respond to light, is uh, about tenfold dimmer light than, than for these uh, optogenetic tools. So we're, you know, this is actually, other than melanopsin, this is really the best, uh, the best, the most sensitive photosensitizer that we know about uh, so far. Um, so I, I mentioned that these, these compounds are, are drugs, essentially, so they will be metabolized. They'll wear off over time. Uh, but it, fortunately, and we don't exactly know why, DNAC lasts a lot longer than AAQ. So the red trace here is the decay of the AAQ effect in the eye uh, measured from different retinas extracted from, from mice. And it, it wears off within 12 to 24 hours after intravitreal injection. DNAC wears off over you know, a week or so. The half-life is a couple of days. This molecule, BNAC, which I also showed you in the last slide, lasts for, can last for several weeks in the eye. It's just, it persists in the vitreous for a long time. And to extend this out even further, we're collaborating with Aaron, Aaron Lavick, who's a uh, bioengineer at Case Western Reserve, and we're encapsulating DNAC in uh, polymer microspheres and nanospheres that uh, can slowly release the compound over a period of many tens of days at months. 
So it's conceivable that molecules like this with the right formulation could install light sensitivity for a really prolonged period of time. Um, and uh, so the most, one of the really surprises that we've uh, stumbled across in recent, in, the, in just the past couple of months is that, um, is that it seems, it seems that the photosensitivity is specific to retinas that are exhibiting disease. It, uh, this molecule only exerts its effect if the rods and cones are dead in the retina. So here's a recording from, again, a multi-electrode array, but in this case, we've put on a bunch of neurotransmitter antagonists to block all synaptic inputs to the, to the retinal ganglion cells. And you can see that, that DNAC in this RD1 retina photosensitizes the ganglion cells themselves, and it does so very powerfully. If we do the same experiment with, uh, with a wild-type retina, of course, the wild-type retina ordinarily responds to light, so we see a light response if we don't block the retinal circuitry. But if we block all the synapses and put on DNAC, we see no conferring of light responses to these cells. And we've compared now a bunch of retinas from from uh, strains of mice where the rods and cones are alive or the rods and cones are dead. Uh, the, the ones where they're alive include wild-type mice and mice that have gene knockouts that disrupt function in rods and cones and melanopsin cells, but don't kill off the cells. And here are two different RD uh, strains of mice where the rods and cones really do die. This is RD1. Uh, which has a mutation on phosphodiesterase, and RD4, which has a mutation in transducin. And in both of these cases, the rods and cones die off within a month or so. And D you can see that DNAC only makes things light sensitive if the rods and cones are dead. So this raises some really interesting questions. There must be some trophic influence of rods and cones over the ganglion cells that sort of, sort of introduces the target uh, for DNAC, and we've sort of backed into this uh, discovery that there's uh, that the target for this drug is something that is itself uh, affected by the disease and, in fact, upregulated by the disease. So we're in search of, of what this ion channel type might be. So finally, uh, DNAC wouldn't really be very useful if it were toxic. And, you know, this requires a lot of work in, in larger animals, but at least at a first approximation, uh, doing sort of anatomical studies, measuring the thicknesses of the outer and inner nuclear layers, measuring the density of retinal ganglion cells in the retina, we see no difference between sham-injected and DNAC-injected eyes. So, um, so it doesn't seem to be toxic, at least at first approximation. So, so uh, just to summarize, these are some of the advantages of this DNAC molecule over our previous photo switches. It responds to visible light. Uh, it, it, retina is treated with this compound. Respond to dim levels of light. Uh, the molecule persists in the eye for weeks, so obviating the need to constantly resupply it. Um, it seems to affect diseased tissue, but not healthy tissue, which may also be useful in cases where only part of the retina is affected by disease, for example, macular degeneration. Um, it's, so far, we think it's safe and non-toxic, and it can drive visual behavior uh, in vivo. And in looking forward to the potential clinical application of this, um, you, could, you could imagine, you know, the, the sort of grand... Uh, prize is restoring visual function in patients with end-stage photoreceptor degenerative disease. But because this is a small molecule where you can, you know, theoretically adjust the dosing of it, uh, you're not really um, overpowering the other systems in the eye by, by you know, using a completely separate photosensor. Um, you can imagine this being used to simply enhance low-level vision. Uh, being a potassium channel blocker, it actually tends to amplify uh, synaptic uh, signaling. And also, um, just as a, a, a method for validating whether there's uh, integrity in the visual system downstream from the retina, having a, a, a drug, a metabolizable drug that you can inject to just make sure that the brain is capable of receiving and interpreting signals from the retina you can imagine using molecules like DNAC just to validate the functional integrity before undergoing other kinds of uh, dramatic treatments, for example, uh, implanting a retinal chip. 
So, um, so with that, I wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge the people in the lab that have done uh, this work. There's been many people involved in this over the years. Uh, most recently, Ivan Tuchitsky and Alan Polisakina, two graduate students in the lab who have done all the multi-electrode array recording and behavior and, uh, and uh, other kinds of analysis with blind retinas. Um, and then uh, Dirk Trauner and Matt Banghart are the people who really invented these photo switch molecules that we've been using. So, um, and I, I didn't mention uh, recent experiments with William Beltran at the University of Pennsylvania, who's doing uh, experiments with blind dogs. We see the same sort of phenomenon that DNAC can restore light sensitivity to retinal ganglion cells in blind dogs, but it doesn't seem to have any effect on the ganglion cells from uh, normal, normally sighted dogs. And um, all the different uh, funding organizations that supported this work. So, thank you. So the story started to have a patient who comes to see me. He works in a, a per se restaurant, and then he complains that he's bumping into things and get lots of cuts in his legs. And his friends thought that maybe he should get his eyes checked. <laughs> and then uh, eventually he found that this is a, indeed is a, uh, is a, almost a human equivalent for the LD1 uh, mouse. It's a mutation in the phosphodiesterase alpha subunit, and uh, one of them is a novel uh, mutation. And the, uh, so the, the pictures of his eye, this, this is the uh, optic nerve and this is the right eye compared to a normal. You see the intraretinal pigment migration sp sparing the central macula. This is the right eye and there's the left eye. And I'll highlight the uh, purpose of the mouse project that the, when most patients, when they first come to see us in the clinic, they already emit a late stage of the disease already. Versus that in some of the uh, previous at least mouse models that, that I have done, uh, they come before the onset of the disease. So they will be the uh, purpose of the project. So this, this is his, uh, his, uh, another patient of phosphodiesterase mutation, so almost equivalent of the LD1 mouse. This patient also get a lot of epiretinal fibrosis up the membrane peeling. You can see the, uh, uh, the macula and improve the central vision by about two, uh, two lines. So this is a phosphodiesterase gene. That the, if the, so, the, so for gene therapy, some of the early work done by Darba and also done by Bill, that you can just uh, increase the phosphodiesterase with a virus. And we have done both lentivirus and also done with uh, uh, AAV more recently. And uh, so you increase the function of phosphodiesterase. And, but I now uh, break down three parts of the talk and show you the story that we have a um, mouse model that now we can now treat uh, to study the mid-phase mid -phase or late stage of the disease instead of uh, early uh, beginning before the onset of the disease. And then the number, the story for this um, new mouse model teaches us that actually the, you need to save enough rod in order to prevent the cones from dying. You may, the cells, may, the whole retina may read the stage of no return uh, at some point, so you need, in, unless you cross this threshold. And then in a combination of gene therapy, maybe you need some, in, in the gene putting back the, the uh, defective gene for the asterisk, you may also need to do something else and uh, to prevent crossing this stage of no return. And I'll suggest, have some suggestion, maybe a manipulation of the cell survival mTOR pathway. So just put the gene back with the CDN using Odopsin promoter. This is a injection at this point with tag of a red fluorescent protein. You can even see the uh, needle, needle track here. And, and uh, this was done before the mice get the uh, degeneration, so you can uh, envision gene therapy in a neonate or, or, uh, uh, situation. Then one single injection essentially have uh, last, we have this more, last more than almost a year now. So this is the uh, one is a treated eye, Oops. and a uh, treated eye, and the other is a fellow eye. So almost uh, a year, one single injection. But we also found that we pointed. We found that if you treat the this is uh, treated early uh, before the onset degeneration, this is treating a later stage, uh, a mid phase degeneration, that uh, at time goes, 
uh, you treat them at early stage of degeneration, the efficacy is always better than you treat them at the uh, late stage or mid phase of, of the disease. And because we're, we're different students and postdoc doing injection, our surgery part is not as skillful as the surgery done in Bill and done with Deborah, we decided not using a systemic uh, drug to turn on the gene instead of using uh, every time using viruses. So we designed a uh, a phosphodiesterase allele that have a stop cassette in the presence of a drug, this allele would turn on, and that, so this this would block the block the expression of this phosphodiesterase, and the presence of a, a, a inducible drug inducible uh, recombinase would pop out this cassette, and then the uh, this will be on. So we can now give a systemic drug instead of doing uh, a virus every time and, and 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 take away the variability of surgery. So this is just shown in here, maybe uh, you can play the video. So when you, when you, these, are, these are the drug, you can give it systemically. And we'll pop out the, the stop cassette. And then the phosphodiesterase activity will be like the blue protein. So this is shown in uh, in a control mouse is autofluorescent imaging. This this is a calibration bar that we can standardize the amount of autofluorescent uh, in each mouse. This is a uh, uh, heterozygous. There's no uh, essentially a normal control, positive control, and this is a uh, disease mouse with retinitis pigmentosa with no treatment at a uh, early stage and a little bit of a later stage. So you can see that vessel become attenuated, you start getting spots. And then in the, uh, if you treat the uh, early rescue majority of the rods at the uh, early stage treatment, you can get um, pretty much normal compared to control. If you start treating at a later stage, if you treat, do not treat more than half of the <coughs> rods, then you get, uh, the treatment is not as efficacious, slight, only slightly better than, than the uh, uh, negative control. This is looking at histology. This is again the control. You see the rows of nuclei. This is a, uh, a, a positive control. This is a, uh, a normal, pretty much normal mouse. And this is the, as at this stage, a single row of nuclei. If you treat the mice, at, um, they, they, it covers saving a lot in the early stage of the disease. They can get pretty much uh, closer to normal. You will start treating them with a late stage of disease that. Uh, is, it's not as efficacious. He's looking at the ERG responses. For example, look at this box. You treat them at a late stage of disease, you, there's not much different from the negative control. You treat them at an early stage of disease, then you can get back uh, almost uh, close to normal. And then this is, uh, we need a lot of feedback to interpret this uh, picture. This is uh, the peanut stain that uh, Janet uh, talked about on, on the cones. So this is a positive control, this is a normal mouse, and this is the mutant mouse at the LA, LA stage. With, uh, uh, then you get this cone, a funny looking shape. If you treat them at a late stage, or you rescue not enough rods, then you get uh, all these funny looking cone cells. If you treat them at an early stage, then you get a mixture of uh, 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 funny looking cells and normal looking uh, cones. And this is the same case as in patient, this patient C2020. You can see it's a high density central autofluorescent ring. This is a patient with a phosphodiesterase mutation. But OCT uh, looking at the central fovea region, but, but OCT looks pretty normal. And, uh, and then, but, but then in adaptive optics looking at the cone cells, at, uh, so this is close to the central uh, uh, fovea region. This, in a normal patient, you can see the uh, cones at the, at the, as you go later, far away from the fovea in a normal patient, the cones get less and less. And at this stage, even though this patient see 2020, and they see as almost, uh, almost <laughs> normal by OCT, the cones already look funny already. So um, almost at this stage looks like uh, the, the mouse picture on the, on the peanut stain. So this will suggest that you probably need to uh, rest, there's a threshold number of rods you need to rescue before the co cones start looking funny looking, which I, I don't know how to describe these cones other than look funny, or some kind of dysmorphic cone. <laughs> so even putting the cDNA, putting the gene back may not be sufficient, if you, because most of our patients come to clinic, they do not come at early stage of disease, maybe they come at mid and late stage of the disease. 
So there, there, there's a region pretty important that the, uh, let me highlight the uh, inner segment, outer segment junction, or the ellipsoid inner segment. So you do OCT screening, there's high density.